Our story begins with a tale of two families, the silver-haired Heidegger family known for their exceptional combat abilities, especially with the sword, and the orange-haired Wangler family known to excel in magic and the mystic arts. As if driven by a desire to test their strengths against each other to determine which would come out superior, the two families often clashed, sometimes ending up in bloody battles. During one such battle that went on for days and claimed the lives of many who fought under each banner, the prince tried to intervene only to be bathed in blood himself and lose an arm. This enraged the emperor. Enough was enough. To maintain peace in his empire, he decreed that the feud between the two families must cease, and to ensure this, he ordered that they become joined in marriage, or they would both be branded as enemies of the crown. In the Heidegger household, the responsibility of marriage naturally fell to the oldest son and heir of the Marquis Gideon, who was not at all pleased with the decree. He had already set his heart on another woman, and furthermore, he loathed the idea of taking a woman with Wengler blood to be his wife, but the emperor had spoken, and the Marquis demanded that his son fulfill his duty, lest the emperor's wrath fall upon the whole family like a sharp sword, leaving Gideon with no choice but to abide. At the Wangler Manor, the eldest daughter, Paula, is the one assigned to be Gideon's wife, and she is thrilled, having been interested in him for a long time now. For her, this is a wonderful turn of events, a dream come true even, and so she is unable to hide her excitement. But that excitement is quickly squashed on their wedding night, with Gideon making no effort to hide his disgust for her as soon as they are both alone. Pinning her wrists down on the bed, he makes sure Paula understands that he has only married her because of the royal decree, and that he has never felt any affection for her, nor ever will, turning Paula's dream into a nightmare. That would have been the last time Gideon showed himself in Paula's bedroom, if not for the emperor's additional demand for the new couple to produce a child as proof that their marriage isn't a sham, which Gideon again has no choice but to obey. And so Paula's miserable nights continued, causing her to sink deeper into despair. Still, they were successful, and a child was born, a daughter welcomed by both families, though not by her own parents, with her father's emerald eyes and her mother's flaming orange hair that resembled a lion's mane, and so earned her the name Leone. The years passed and the child grew, showered with all the toys, dresses, and ribbons she could ever want, as well as the attention of a handful of servants, but not a drop of affection from either of her parents, who still could not stand to be in the same room, only ending up fighting whenever they did, even in front of their daughter. We take a look at one of Gideon and Paula's biggest fights, which takes place when Leone is only two years old. It is her birthday, in fact, and she is being heaped with presents while her mother watches with almost lifeless eyes when her father barges into the room with the sword in hand. Stomping across the room, he heads straight for his wife and grabs her by the neck, his eyes filled with murderous intent as he accuses Paula of killing the woman he loves. Paula laughs, seemingly going mad, though she denies the accusation, saying Gideon only wants to blame her for everything. Worried for her, one of the maids steps forward to interfere only to be cut down with one swift swing of Gideon's sword, sending blood splattering across the room, some drops even landing on Leone's dress and face, which is pale and filled with fear. Unable to hold back her tears, she wails, and the other maid begs for her master to calm down, only to meet the same tragic fate as her colleague. After that day, no maids are seen with Leone any longer, and she spends her days alone. Sometimes she follows her father in the hallways, hoping for even just one glance or one word. But Gideon doesn't even want to look at her, thinking that she looks like her mother because of her hair. Her mother doesn't want anything to do with her either, because she has her father's green eyes, which fill Paula with fear each time they look at her. Alone, all Leone can do is cry, but in front of others, she still tries to put on a brave face and does her best to keep herself busy, immersing herself in drawing, which she seems to be talented in. Gideon's advisor, Osmo, feels sorry for her, knowing that though her sketches are pretty, they are only a means for her to distract herself from the fact that her parents have practically abandoned her. More years go by, and Gideon is made a duke. To celebrate his inauguration, a lavish ball is held at Heidegger Manor, attended by many of the nobility, some of whom are admirers of the new duke because of his excellent swordsmanship. As they shower him with praise, he smiles, and as Leone peeks from an upstairs balcony, she thinks he is finally happy for the first time. She decides to take advantage of this and give him one of her drawings as a present, so she heads down to the ball, only to be stopped by rumors that her mother is dying. Dropping her drawings, Leone runs to her mother's room, hoping to see her to confirm for herself whether the rumors are true or not, but a maid stands in her way, telling her she will only make her mother feel worse. 
Her eyes grow wide as she realizes that even at a time like this, no one is thinking of her, as if she doesn't exist at all, and with frustration welling up inside her chest, she runs down the hall, ignoring the servants who tell her not to run around because of the guests and making them frown in disapproval. Leonie can hear them whispering about her, and she can feel their dislike, which she does not understand since she hasn't done anything wrong. Does everyone just hate her because her parents don't want her? Is she really so detestable? Going outside the manor, she heads to the stables and jumps on her horse, sending it into a gallop across the grounds in hopes of shaking off the pain in her chest. But instead of getting a reprieve, a bolt of lightning strikes her from the dark skies, and she screams as she falls off her horse losing consciousness as she hits the ground. In the next scene, she wakes up with a jolt and with tears in her eyes, startling Osmo, who tells her she has been unconscious for a few days after her accident. For her, the incident seems like it happened just moments ago, and she can still feel the tingle in her palm from the lightning bolt. She asks if her mother is still alive, and after learning that she is, Leonie jumps off the bed and runs out of the room, in spite of Osmo's pleas for her to give her body time to adjust, wanting to see her mother as soon as possible. Osmo can only watch her go, thinking that something has changed about her. Leonie goes to her mother's room, but the maids stop her once more, scolding her for her persistence. This time she doesn't back down, reminding them that as the Duke's daughter, she is above them and can have them punished as needed. The maids wince at her words, never expecting to hear them, and when Leonie orders them to get out of her way with a glare, they obey, stepping aside and mumbling their apologies. Finally, Leonie gets to see her mother, who is indeed near death on her bed. Still, Paula manages to open her eyes and look at her daughter, remembering who she is. She wants to reach out to her, but she no longer has the strength, her eyes falling shut moments after. Leonie approaches the bed and looks at her, at the pale and skinny woman her mother has been reduced to. She knows her mother wasn't good to her, but now she understands why, understanding her mother's anguish and misery. Leaning over, Leonie whispers a promise in her mother's ear, that she will make her father pay for all the wrong he has committed and teach him pain and despair with her own hands. Hearing these words, Paula slowly opens her eyes to look at her daughter once more, this time seeing her more clearly. Regaining some of her strength, she reaches out to stroke her daughter's cheek, startling Leonie. As Paula takes a wisp of her daughter's hair between her fingers to caress it, Leonie feels as if her mother is seeing her for the first time. And though Paula cannot speak, Leonie finally feels her mother's affection. She hopes her mother will find happiness even if it's just in the remaining days of her life. Paula does seem better for the next few days. And as Leonie pushes her in a wheelchair through the garden, Gideon watches from a window with disdain. He had thought she was dying, so why was she still alive and looking well? Osmo relays what the physician said that Paula is simply expending her remaining strength. Gideon frowns, thinking that even in dying, Paula is causing him trouble. Then he turns his attention to Leonie, asking Osmo how old she is now. Osmo is surprised since this is the first time Gideon has asked about his daughter and replies that she is turning 10 soon. Gideon then asks if there is a party to celebrate her birthday, which surprises Osmo even more, though he takes this as good news. He informs the Duke that no preparations have yet been made for the celebration since the Duke has forbidden parties for his daughter since the tragedy of her second birthday, but says they can be made as soon as he allows them. Osmo also seizes the chance to tell the Duke all about Leonie, having compiled a thorough report of her day-to-day -day activities. He tells the Duke that Leonie diligently attends the academy, and after her classes, purchases painting tools to hone her artistic talents, which have already been recognized by the academy. In fact, it seems the academy wants to hold an exhibit of her paintings. The Duke thinks this is nonsense and tells Osmo not to grant the academy permission not at all impressed or interested in Leonie's artistic prowess. He is more curious to know her grades, and Osmo informs him that Leonie is doing well in her studies, placing second in her class in the previous semester. This pleases Gideon, who thinks that at least Leonie is not as stupid as her mother, and now he wonders if Leonie has a special mystical ability as well, unlike her mother. House Vangler is known for excelling in magic, after all, and at least one Vangler in every generation has been known to have a unique mystical gift, such as foreseeing the future, manipulating the weather, and even mind control. Still, these gifts have been diminishing with every generation, and if Leonie has one, it may not be very powerful. Though even so, Osmo thinks it would be a good thing which might finally earn Leonie some respect from her father and others. They will have to wait until she's 15 to find out, though, since that is the age that mystic abilities manifest. Gideon frowns, then asks about Leonie's swordsmanship, 
She is half Heidegger after all, so surely at her age, she can already produce the vestiges of an aura. Osmo informs him, however, that she cannot yet produce an aura, which makes him snort. If it wasn't so pathetic, it would have been amusing how the Emperor ordered the Heidegger and Wangler families to merge to produce a child of exceptional talent only to create a completely useless one. Gideon asks if there is anything else for Osmo to report, and Osmo in fact has one more thing to mention, which is that Leonie has paid a visit to the Countess Michelson three times. Gideon has heard of this woman who is known to accept shady requests from the nobility and carry them out in secret using any means necessary her only payment that she too be granted a request in the future when the need arises, whatever the request may be, and he does not understand what Leone could possibly want from her. Osmo replies that the Countess has recently acquired some rare books about Eastern art, which Leone wanted to buy. The Duke finds this an acceptable reason, dropping any suspicions he has. After all, Leone is still too young to make any request of that vile woman, and in spite of her grades, he does not believe she is all that smart either her pretty face her only redeeming quality which should fetch her a wealthy husband. In fact, he gives Osmo the order to start looking into marriage candidates for Leone, but only those with substantial offers. Then as Osmo's final task, he tells Osmo to bring the physician, rubbing his temple as he says his headaches have been getting worse. His assignments are received. Osmo nods and leaves the room, promising to bring the physician right away. In the greenhouse, Leone and Paula are having tea, finally passing off as mother and daughter though some awkwardness lingers between them. Paula is curious about how his daughter will punish Gideon exactly, and Leonie only gives a vague reply, likening her father to a frog swimming leisurely in a pot of boiling water, unaware that his death is at hand. Paula does not press for details, but she does have one request, that Leonie make Gideon beg for death. She knows she has no right to ask anything of her child though, and she hopes that one day, Leonie can forgive her. Maybe when Leonie has a child of her own, then she will be able to imagine what it feels like to look at the face of one's beloved child only to see the face of the monster who created her, which Paula claims is the cruelest curse she has ever had to endure, though she prays, of course, that Leonie will not have to suffer the same fate. In fact, she has prayed for this every second of every day since Leonie was born, which she thinks is proof that she loved Leonie. Leonie is surprised to hear this, and though she wishes she had received even just a little affection from her mother, she does believe that her mother loved her in the best way she knew how. She is glad that her mother's prayers have been answered and tells Paula that she can go in peace now and finally escape the hellish prison she has endured for more than 10 years. Paula gives one last apology, this time for having to leave Leonie alone, but Leonie says she will be all right, and Paula believes Leonie will be, smiling as she bids her daughter farewell. Then she closes her eyes, and as the sunlight shines on her face that is finally at peace, she breathes her last. Silence falls upon the greenhouse as Leone gazes at her mother, feeling sorry for her because of all the suffering she has endured in her short life, yet feeling glad that she is now free like the butterflies fluttering among the flowers in bloom. Now, there is only one thing left to do. After bidding her mother a fond farewell, she summons a maid, who shows up just seconds after. And with a solemn expression, Leone gives the orders to prepare for a funeral. The preparations go underway, the servants getting everything ready as the sky seemingly mourns with Heidegger Manor. As they attend to their tasks, they engage in their usual chatter, both about the deceased Duchess and the daughter who has been left behind. They think Leone must have holed herself up in her room, but in truth, Leone is actually headed to the royal palace, a spy following her as per the Duke's instructions. He cannot follow her to the restricted section of the royal library though, so he can only wait outside and wonder what the young lady can possibly be up to. The door to the restricted section of the royal library opens with a creak, and Leonie steps in, greeted by a servant who tells her the emperor has been waiting for her. She is led past the aisles, lined with bookshelves, until she sees him, and she curtsies, greeting him and humbly pledging herself at his service to which the emperor responds with a grin. The day of Paula's funeral arrives. A maid helps Leone get ready, offering to tie her hair so that it will look less rowdy, saying that many people from distinguished families will most likely be present. Leone, however, no longer wants to have to lower herself just to meet their expectations or to please them. They can think whatever they want. 
she has already made up her mind not to be afraid of anything. She leaves her room and goes out into the hallway where the Duke is waiting. She gives a curtsy and greets him respectfully, and he approves of her good manners, allowing her to attend the funeral with him instead of asking her to get out of his sight, which Osmo notes is what the Duke usually does. They head to the chapel, where the guests are already seated, marveling at how resplendent it looks on this particular occasion, almost as if adorned for a wedding and not a funeral. It is clearly a funeral though, with the Duke and Leone in mourning clothes and a black coffin surrounded by roses at the altar. Leone notes that her grandparents, the Marquis and Marchioness of Heidegger, are not present, but she wonders if maybe her mother would have preferred it that way. At least, the royal chamberlain has come to pay the emperor's respects, even bringing special lilies from the royal garden to convey the emperor's sincere condolences. This draws murmurs from the crowd, who didn't expect his majesty to send a representative, and the royal chamberlain no less, to Duchess Paula's funeral. They whisper about how unfortunate it is that Paula is no longer alive to receive such a great honor, but Leone, who hears them, wonders if it is truly an honor. The duke interrupts her thoughts, asking her of her whereabouts the day before, having already received the report of his spy who lost track of her. Leone tells him the truth, that she was at the library, and the duke replies that she must be out of her mind to leave the house in the middle of funeral preparations. He says he has a gift for her though, which he will give her after the funeral, which he believes will surely surprise her, but which he hopes will not make her lose her composure, since she is a Heidegger after all. Leone grins, wondering which Heidegger will lose composure first. Incidentally, she has also prepared a gift for her father, which she tells her father about as she puts on a serious expression and a humble demeanor, genuinely hoping that he will like it, and the Duke's curiosity is piqued. He replies that he is looking forward to this present, which is just what Leone wants to hear. After the funeral ceremony, the guests gather to have tea and to chat, the most popular subject of gossip being the next Duchess. Now that Paula is dead, after all, daughters from noble families are sure to throw themselves at the Duke's feet, especially since he is still young and dashing, and without a son. They do not know if he has already gotten over his deceased lover, though, so whoever he weds might have a difficult time. Suddenly, the Countess Michelson speaks, saying the rewards of marrying the Duke outweigh the difficulties. All heads turn towards her, talking about her now as they wonder what a vile woman like her is doing at Paula's funeral. Duke Vangler, Leone's grandfather, asks the Countess out loud why she came, but she just grins. And before anyone can speculate further about her, a hush falls over the room as a blue-haired, pregnant woman and a girl with green eyes appear. Not minding the crowd, the little girl runs to the Duke, calling him father, as she throws herself at him, and he embraces her with a smile, making everyone realize that Duke Heidegger has another child. Carrying the girl in her arms, he beckons the woman to come to his side, and then introduces her to everyone as his new duchess, Magda Lichter, who everyone recognizes as the sister of Eliza Lichter, the Duke's former lover. As for the girl in his arms, she is indeed his daughter, Sharon Heidegger, who quickly charms everyone with her smile. The crowd buzzes, while some are still in shock to hear the Duke's revelations, and others still feel sorry for Leone, who must feel upset to learn of all this so soon after her mother's death. Leone, however, does not feel upset at all. In fact, she grins, pleased that everything is going just as they did before. We pause our story to learn of what happened before, for indeed, this is Leone's second chance at life. In her previous one, she reached the age of 32 though all her days were filled with misery. Even though she was the firstborn daughter of the Duke, her stepmother and Sharon looked down on her and ridiculed her, and even most of the maids followed suit, having no respect for her whatsoever. One of them felt sorry for Leone and told the others to be a little kinder to her since she is still the Duke's daughter, but the maid just laughed. Why does she have to be kind to Leone when her mother is dead and the Duke himself does not treat her as his daughter. Leone tries to ignore these hurtful remarks, instead continuing to do her best to become a good daughter. One day, her father summons her to his study, and she goes, greeting him with a proper curtsy. His first question, as always, is whether or not her mystical abilities have awakened, and she answers that they haven't, which elicits a look of disappointment from him as he slams his hand on his desk, the loud sound making Leone wince. Then, the Duke lets out a sigh of exasperation, remarking that his Leone is neither magically gifted nor good with the sword, making her utterly useless in his eyes. These words hurt Leone more than what the servants whisper every day, especially since she knows that her father has always loved Sharon unconditionally, but she says nothing. The Duke notices that her mind is wandering, though, and scolds her, telling her to listen as he tells her that he will start looking for a husband for her, making it clear that this is the only way she can be useful. And the Duke does find not just one, but three husbands for her, each one coming with a large sum of money. 
The first was a prince, though his position was mostly symbolic. He was kind, and so Leone was happy with him but he was assassinated after just a year. The second was a man with long dark hair who gave her a son, Emil, but both he and the child disappeared, and the marriage was soon annulled. As for the third, he was also a prince. But unlike Leone's first husband, he didn't love her at all, barely paying any attention to her. And so Leone ended up having the same fate as her mother. But there was still light at the end of the tunnel since the same day Leone found out she was pregnant again, her mystical abilities also awakened, though not fully, so she decided to keep it a secret. She did tell her husband about her pregnancy though, but shortly after, the prince had to leave for battle. Leone decided to wait for his return, in the meantime vowing to protect herself and her child. But just weeks later, she was dragged out of the castle and thrown into jail for a crime she didn't do. She tried to ask her grandfather, Marquis Heidegger, for help, but he turned his back on her, and she could not reach her husband either, hearing no news from the battlefield. Then again, even if he heard that she was in prison, would he come to her aid? Would he even care? Only Osmo, her father's advisor, took pity on her and tried to help her, telling her to hang on while Countess Michelson figured something out. But with each day that passed, she felt herself sinking deeper and deeper into despair. Her unborn child and her mystical ability, the only things giving her hope and keeping her sane. Finally, one day, she hears footsteps outside her cell. She holds her breath as she waits to see who they belong to, hoping that she will finally be free. But her heart sinks as she sees Sharon, the last person she wants to see, who gives a mocking <laughs> laugh as she comments that prison suits Leone. Leone asks why Sharon came, knowing she wouldn't come all this way just to ridicule her even though it is her favorite thing to do, and Sharon turns to the man accompanying her, who steps forward and throws something on the floor. Seeing Osmo's severed head, Leone gasps and screams in horror, tears flowing down her cheeks. Sharon grins, but she is not done tormenting Leone yet. She tells her half-sister that her husband, the Eighth Prince, has won the battle, defeating all of his brothers with the help of their father, Duke Heidegger. And now, he is going to be the Emperor, and Sharon is going to be his Empress, which means Leone is no longer needed. This news fills Leone with shock and dread, and she asks fearfully what is going to become of her unborn baby to which Sharon replies with another cackle of mocking <laughs> laughter that echoes throughout the dungeon. She finds it funny that Leone thinks that her unborn baby would want to live when Leone will clearly not make a good mother. But there is something else she finds more amusing, which is the fact that just like her mother killed Paula, Sharon is going to kill her sister. Leone could not believe her ears. Magda killed her mother? How could she? And now Sharon wants to kill her too? Anger erupts in Leone's chest, and she shouts calling Sharon and the Duchess monsters. Hearing Leone's outburst, Sharon loses her temper as well, no longer amused. Grabbing Leonie's hair through the bars, she says that everything is Leonie's fault, having been born first and getting all the best titles, leaving her no choice but to turn into a monster. Then she calms herself down, her smug grin returning as she bids Leonie farewell. Turning on her heel, she leaves, and the man with her enters Leonie's cell, sword in hand. Trembling in fear, Leonie begs for mercy as she crawls away, but the man comes closer, and eventually Leonie feels her back against the wall. Out of desperation, she pleads for help, and suddenly, she hears a voice inviting her to step into another world. Longing to escape, she accepts the invitation, and a bright light blazes inside her cell. At the same time, she hears footsteps running down the corridor outside her cell, as well as a familiar voice shouting for everything to stop. Gasping for air, Prince Rutger appears outside Leonie's cell, calling her name with tears brimming in his eyes, and Leonie is glad that at least she gets to see him one last time. She is unsure why he has come though, and she asks him if he's going to kill her too, but before she can hear his answer, she vanishes, the blazing light taking her away. Only her dress remains inside the cell, and Prince Rutger falls on his knees in shock, the mercenary with him stumbling back in disbelief as well. It is at this same moment that Leone turns back into a child, and as she is struck by lightning atop her horse, all her previous memories return. Since that day, she has vowed to exact revenge on everyone who has plotted her downfall and longed for her destruction, to find the children she had lost, and to protect the ones she loves. Thus, we come back to the present, where the Duke has just presented Sharon and his new Duchess, while Leone just stares at them, waiting for her turn to give her father her surprise. In a way, she is glad that he has repeated the same cruel thing he has done in the past, because now she can punish him without hesitation. She stays silent as her father puts Sharon down, giving the younger girl a slight push as a prompt to introduce herself to her older half-sister. And Sharon reluctantly does so, giving Leonie a dazzling smile and welcoming her into the family. But Leonie does not smile back, 
nor does she waste any time on Sharon. Glancing at the Royal Chamberlain and Countess Michelson, who are both in the room, she puts her plan into action, bravely announcing to everyone that she cannot accept Magda Lichter as her stepmother, for the simple reason that Magda murdered her mother, Paula, the former Duchess Heidegger. At this even more controversial piece of news, the room breaks into fresh murmurs, this time painting Magda Lichter in a negative light as the speculations swirl about her being a murderer. Was the previous Duchess really killed instead of naturally dying from an illness like everyone believes? Magda's eyes grow wide in shock, but the Duke and Duchess Vangler, Paula's parents, are even more bewildered, and they are the first to ask if there is any truth to Leone's claim. Gideon, however, is the first to deny it, defending his fiancée's innocence and accusing Leone of losing her wits as a result of losing her mother. Leone doesn't answer, nor flinch as she squarely meets her father's glare, already used to the sharp edge of his tongue. It is Countess Michelson who speaks, directing everyone's attention to the witnesses to the crime, a pair of maids who burst through the door sobbing, their faces covered in bruises. Falling on their knees, they turn to Magda, pleading with her for both her forgiveness and her help. And since they seem too rattled to speak clearly, it is Countess Michelson who gives the explanation everyone is waiting for, saying that the maids have already confessed to Magda bribing them, ordering them to poison Paula slowly. She submits the written confession to the royal chamberlain, as well as the vials of the poison used by the maids, and the receipts for the purchase of the said poison with Magda's signature, and he begins to study the evidence in silence. Meanwhile, Gideon continues to seethe, gritting his teeth and glaring at everyone as they continue to whisper about the murder. He has endured being married to Paula for so long. He has waited for a chance to be happy for so long, so why does everything have to fall apart now? He directs his anger towards Leone, whom he blames for all this nonsense, which he never expected her to come up with. What exactly is this little brat playing at? With the spotlight now on her, Leone starts to cry as she begs her father to open his eyes to the truth, instead of being blinded by love, telling him to be mindful of his position as Duke Heidegger, the sword of the empire and the Duke falls speechless, his ears becoming deaf to the pleas of Magda, who is by his side, asking him to believe in her innocence. Countess Michelson grins, thinking that such a little girl has gotten the better of the Duke by painting him as a foolish victim of love, and Leone is not yet done, going on to say that in her hopes of helping her mother get better, she read every book on every illness and was able to come to the conclusion that her mother's symptoms were not of any illness, but of the so-called potion of inheritance, another name for arsenic. Leone's grandparents gasp along with everyone else, aware that arsenic is normally used as fertilizer, and when consumed, can cause a slow but certain death resembling a serious chronic illness. For this reason, it is often used by heirs to poison each other, hence its nickname Potion of Inheritance. In this case, it seems it was used by Magda for a similar goal, to steal the title of duchesses from Paula. Leone continues to speak, enumerating the symptoms of arsenic poisoning, all of which her mother experienced, most notably the spotted pigmentation on Paula's skin as she came closer to death. Still, Gideon does not believe Leone's claim, insisting that Paula suffered from a chronic illness as the physician diagnosed. But Leone has another piece of evidence, which is what her mother told her just before dying. The crowd holds their breath, waiting for this crucial piece of information, and Duke Vangler places his hands on his granddaughter's shoulders, encouraging her to go on. Nodding, Leone tells everyone that Paula complained of her medicine smelling and tasting like soap, and the crowd gasps, the Duchess Vangler trembling in shock with tears in her eyes, after all, it is also common knowledge that arsenic is one of the ingredients in soap. The royal chamberlain steps forward, asking Duke Heidegger if he has something to add. But Gideon is utterly speechless by now, and the royal chamberlain gives the order for the arrest of Magda based on the evidence presented to him, saying that he will hand over the investigation to the proper authorities. Magda screams as she is taken away, and Sharon starts to sob, clinging to her mother's skirt and begging her father to do something. Gideon, however, can do nothing but ask the guards to treat his wife with care until her charges have been finalized, especially since she's pregnant. Watching him trying so hard to hold on to the Heidegger composure he spoke of, Leone grins in satisfaction, though no one sees it because her grandfather hugs her tight, placing his hand on the back of his granddaughter's head. Duke Vangler looks back on when his daughter was still alive, thinking he should have tried harder to stop her. 
He had suggested that Paula flee the empire, in fact, so she wouldn't have to be forced into marriage. But she insisted on going, opting for marriage over a life in exile with her much younger brother. And when Duke Vangler told her that at least she can start over and marry whoever she wants, she replied that she was in love with Gideon Heidegger. And at that moment, Duke Vangler knew that Paula would end up being miserable, especially since he knew that Gideon Heidegger already had a woman. But Paula had already made up her mind, even going so far as to turn her back on her parents for their lack of support. Sobbing, Duchess Vangler regrets not reaching out to her daughter now, wishing Paula had told her and the Duke about all her suffering instead of enduring everything alone. However, Paula felt that since she was the one who insisted on being with Gideon, she alone had to pay the price, which she did, ultimately paying with her life. What has happened can no longer be changed, though, and what matters is what can be done now. Understanding this, Duke Vangler asks the royal chamberlain that he be designated the guardian of Leone and take her home until it can be ascertained that her life is not in danger. Leone is surprised to hear this, since in her previous life her grandfather simply disappeared from the capital after Paula's death, never to return. It seems the story is changing now, but Leone thinks it isn't exactly a bad turn of events. In fact, it may just be better for her if the Vangler family is behind her to support her in carrying out her plans for revenge. Indeed, things are getting more interesting now. Countess Michelson supports Duke Vangler's proposal, pointing out that Leone still addresses Duke Heidegger formally as if they are not related by blood, so it may be best for Leone to stay with her grandfather. The royal chamberlain takes this into consideration and then nods, saying that he accepts Duke Vangler's proposal in the emperor's behalf, placing Leone in the care of her grandfather until the throne finishes its investigation on Duchess Paula's death, and if it is found that no murder has been committed, Leone will then be returned to her father. Duke Heidegger doesn't exactly approve of this, but he has no choice but to accept the arrangement. The royal chamberlain leaves, and Countess Michelson follows, bidding Leone farewell, the two exchanging grins like old friends. Osmo carries Sharon out of the room as well, but Sharon throws a tantrum, sobbing and not wanting to go anywhere. The rest of the guests make their hasty departure to give the family some privacy, but Leone knows that they just want to leave to talk about what happened more openly and spread the gossip which is quite juicy after all. After they have left, Duchess Vangler invites Leone to leave too. But Leone still has something to say to her father. He glares at her, not wanting to have anything more to do with her. But she goes on to speak, asking her father to let Sharon wear her clothes instead. This makes Gideon's gaze even colder. Thinking that Leone is insulting both Sharon and him by making her into some kind of beggar. And in spite of her courage, Leone winces, wavering for a moment. But her grandmother stands behind her, placing an encouraging hand on her granddaughter's shoulder. Meeting Gideon's gaze, she tells him that Leone is not foolish enough to pity every child born out of wedlock, and so Leone must have a reason behind what she just said. She tells her granddaughter to continue speaking, and Leone proceeds to play the role she had in mind, telling everyone that she was happy to learn she had a sister, which gave her hope that maybe she would no longer have to be alone. This moves Duchess Vangler to tears, and she wraps her arms around Leone, now realizing how alone she must have felt and feeling both guilty and sorry for her. Leone is not done though, not yet having said the most important thing, which entails pointing out that Sharon's dress is strange. She elaborates, saying that in the course of learning how to paint, she has learned all about colors and how they are made, and she says that the kind of gold on Sharon's dress is made largely from lead, which is why it is a paint that must be handled with gloves. Otherwise, the lead may be absorbed through the skin and cause health problems, making the substance dangerous, which means that Sharon's dress is actually dangerous. Gideon does not believe this since he knows Magda had Sharon's dress made according to her instructions. Why would she let her child wear such a dangerous dress? He thinks it must be a mistake, and the dressmakers no less, swearing to kill whoever made the dress as his temper overtakes him. But Duke Vangler tells him to calm down and think clearly. Does he really believe the dressmaker is at fault? He asks Gideon to put himself in Magda's place. If he had been through what Magda endured, wouldn't he hate the Heideggers as well, and not just Paula? Leone understands what her grandfather is saying, thinking Magda has a reason to hold a grudge against her father, since Duke Heidegger abandoned Eliza after all, and then let her die. But Gideon refuses to even consider this, saying he will not tolerate any insults to his wife. Duke Vangler is not phased, however, and tells the younger Duke that it is in his best interest to investigate his own home, saying he will not let Leone return to Heidegger Manor unless it is completely safe. This warning issued, he takes his wife and granddaughter and walks out of the room, leaving Gideon gritting his teeth in frustration. 
As much as he hates to admit it though, he knows that the older Duke's words contain a grain of wisdom, and so he decides to heed Duke Vangler's advice and conduct his own investigation, promptly summoning Osmo. At the Vangler Manor, Leone is treated like a princess, given a beautiful dress and a delicious feast with more food than she can hope to finish. Her grandparents encourage her to eat as much as she can, though, telling her she has to regain her strength so that she can recover from all the hardships she has been through at Heidegger Manor, and she feels a certain pressure to meet their expectations, but they assure her she can rest at ease while in their company. In fact, they are ready to give her everything she needs, even going so far as to have one of the rooms remodeled to be her bedroom. For the first time, Leonie feels cared for and she feels slightly overwhelmed but is grateful to finally have a loving home and feel like she is truly part of a family. There are two other members of this family, her uncles, whom the Duke and Duchess promised to introduce to her later. Unknown to them, the two boys are already peeking through the gap in the door, curious about their niece who they have already been told about. They have heard that she has been through a tough time, and as a way of being nice to her, have prepared a welcome present for her, which they hope she will like. They were going to wait until later to give it to her, but the present starts to get restless, threatening to escape. Panicking, they try to do their best to hold on to it, and the Duke hears the ruckus, looking at the door. Just as he asks what is going on outside, the door bursts open. The sugar glider the boys have been holding jumping out of their hands and flying through the air, going straight for Leone. Startled, Leone screams but tries to catch the critter just the same, and as it lands in her hands, she stares at it, confused. In fact, the whole experience catches her off guard. Is this what the Vangler family is like? As Leone gets lost in a daze, Duke Vangler scolds the two boys for their reckless behavior, but they only cower for a second, gathering their bearings and displaying their charm as they say they were simply too excited to finally meet their niece. Ignoring the Duchess, they run straight to her to introduce themselves, the older boy with blonde hair named Jan, who is Paula's younger brother, and the younger one with red hair named Tobias or Toby for short, who is Paula and Jan's cousin, essentially making them both her uncles. They ask Leonie if she likes their present, which is a sugar glider, a popular pet among children of nobility, and Leonie doesn't answer because she doesn't know. She technically isn't a child after all. And as for the sugar glider, which has now fallen asleep, she finds it more pitiful than adorable, which makes her unsure if she likes it or not. Sensing that Leonie is feeling a bit uncomfortable, Duchess Vangler tells the boys to stop bothering Leonie and let her finish eating, but Leonie claims she's already full, and she finally thanks her uncles for their gift, honestly telling them she finds it cute but too small, making her feel sorry for it. Duke Vangler chuckles, glad to know that his granddaughter has a soft heart. As for the boys, they give each other a meaningful look as they take note of what Leonie just said then ask her to confirm that she means she wants something big and strong. Leonie doesn't answer, laughing but worrying at the same time. Somehow she has a bad feeling about what her uncles are planning to do next. For our next scene, we find Duke Heidegger taking a trip to the dungeon to visit Magda. He stands in front of her cell, asking her how she is and if there is anything else she needs. But Magda tells him to drop the act, thinking he must already surely know about her crimes. Indeed, Gideon has already discovered everything that Magda has done, having hired an alchemist and an artist to look into his study. After a thorough investigation, the alchemist concluded that the dye used on the Duke's chair is one that is no longer used due to its toxicity, which makes his temper rise as he realizes it is the very same chair Magda gave him as a present to commemorate their anniversary. Now, he knows why he has been having persistent headaches, and the alchemist and artist confirm this, saying the only reason why the Duke is still fine is probably due to his robust health as a swordsman. They add that he should be fine after he takes the antidote, and he thanks them for their service, then orders Osmo to have them inspect every inch of the rest of the mansion, as well as to replace every piece of furnishing that was installed sometime within the past eight years. He no longer trusts Magda after all, though he is still baffled by her behavior. Why stay with him for eight years just to kill him? And he would have died, knowing that if Leone had not discovered the truth about the color of Sharon's dress, he never would have found out what Magda was plotting. He had thought Leone was planning to make a fool of him with a silly outburst when she said she had a present for him, but in the end, she saved him by exposing Magda's secrets. Leone was not able to offer an explanation for Magda's crimes though. Only Magda can give him that, and he demands it from her now, asking her why she planned on killing him when he thought they both loved each other, and Eliza, whom they both lost. 
Magda shouts at him, disgusted by his self-pity that has gone on for far too long. She says Gideon keeps talking about losing Eliza, but the truth is that Gideon threw her away. He kept saying how miserable he was that he had to marry someone he didn't love. But did he ever stop to think of how Eliza felt or try to console her? Did he even apologize to her for marrying someone else or think of asking her to wait for him while he tried to find a way to be with her? Gideon cannot believe Magda's words or the depth of the grudge she feels against him. Does she really think he didn't want to be with Eliza? He wanted so badly to go to her, but after the emperor's decree, he was placed under house arrest, and he tells Magda so. But Magda just laughs. So what if he was placed under house arrest? With his sword skills, he could have easily defeated the guards watching over him and escaped to elope with Eliza. Instead, he chose wealth and his high status in society, using his parents and the emperor as an excuse only to end up destroying his wife and crawling to her, Eliza's sister, for comfort after Eliza's death. Did he even know how the woman he claims he loved died? Magda tells him her sister tried to kill herself every chance she got, sobbing day and night until she fell ill. Feeling sorry for their daughter, her parents decided to bring her to a convent to find peace. But on the way, the carriage they were in met an accident, and they all died. Just like that, Magda lost her entire family, and there were times when she wanted to join them, but she couldn't which only made her despise herself, letting her lead a miserable life. Gideon listens, finally understanding Magda's pain. He still has one question though. Why did she make Sharon, her own daughter, wear a harmful dress? Magda answers honestly, saying she didn't mind killing her own daughter if it meant seeing Gideon suffer. She adds that it is a shame her plot was discovered, or she would have been able to see the whole Heidegger family disappear, not just Paula. Still, she can at least kill the child in her womb that has his filthy blood. But Gideon calmly says he will not allow this. He orders the guard to keep an eye on her and make sure she doesn't hurt herself. Then he leaves, walking away from the woman he once loved, but who he probably will never see again. After coming from the dungeon, he heads to the palace, hoping to settle the other matter weighing on his mind. At Paula's funeral, his mind was too clouded by emotion that he failed to pay attention to how the royal chamberlain accepted Leone's claims and the evidence presented by Countess Michelson without question. But he has been thinking about it lately, and he has realized how unusual it seems. There is only one explanation he can think of, and he has come to the palace, seeking an audience with the emperor to confirm it. As he stands before the emperor, he boldly but respectfully states his question. What kind of deal did Leone strike with his majesty? The emperor grins thinking that the day would never come when he would see Duke Heidegger sweating. Yet here he is, clearly uneasy, making the emperor want to rattle his composure even more. He mentions that Leone told him the Duke has two more children, Sharon and another who is yet to be born, both of whom he had been keeping a secret until recently. Then he asks the Duke a question, wondering if he truly did not know that Paula was being slowly poisoned to her death. Gideon replies that he did not, adding that if he wanted Paula dead, he would have killed her swiftly with one swing of his sword, which the emperor believes, having seen the duke in battle. His question answered, he now proceeds to answer the dukes, starting by explaining that some time ago, Countess Mikkelsen approached him to ask that he meet with Leonie. At first, the emperor did not feel inclined to, not trusting the countess. But then the countess told him something interesting, which is that Leone has a mystical ability, specifically the rare gift to travel through space and time using her paintings. Apparently, she is from the future, having traveled back in time after making a painting of her mother's funeral, which she got sucked into. It was so bewildering that the emperor did not believe it at first. But while the countess is many things, the emperor knows she is not a liar, and it seems she has spoken the truth, judging by what actually transpired at Paula's funeral, where the duke ended up getting completely humiliated. Gideon's eyebrows furrow. So Leone already knew how things would turn out? Does she know everything that is about to happen? The emperor can see that the duke is troubled, and he understands why thinking that it would trouble any man to know he had a lion cub in his care and not have any clue. The emperor remarks that while Leone is a force to be reckoned with, she is still a child, though proven by her attachment to her half-siblings, who she even ordered the emperor to leave alone while looking straight into his eyes. Gideon does not know how to respond to this, so he goes back to his original query about the bargain between Leone and the emperor, curious about what Leone offered specifically. The emperor answers that this depends on Gideon, who frowns, not liking how the emperor seems to be treating Leone as his own daughter. 
He still has to give a reply though, and so he tells the emperor he will restore order on the Western Front, which seems to be having troubles at the moment, within a month. The emperor laughs, glad to hear this reply, though he tells the duke to be careful since the age of swordsmen is coming to an end, being replaced by cannons and more powerful weapons. The duke understands this, but he also points out that weapons are still wielded by men, making it clear to the emperor that he will always be in need of capable soldiers like him. The emperor accedes, but says what he truly wants more than soldiers or victories is something only Leone can provide. Looking at his hand, he reflects on his power, which is the one members of the imperial family possess, the power of dominion, which is the ability to read a subject's mind and then force them into obedience, all by simply laying a hand on their head. It is with this power that he can keep strong men like Gideon under control. However, he has learned that it is slowly fading with each passing year, filling him with fear, and yet, when he learned about Leone's ability, he was filled with hope, thinking that maybe when Leone is stronger, she can help bring him back to the days of his prime, just as she returned from the future. Gideon is stunned, having only heard of this special circumstance known as retraction. Is this truly what the emperor is aiming for? The emperor continues to speak, saying that if only the duke had paid his daughter more attention and given her a bit of affection, he would probably still have her and be able to use her as a bargaining chip to further his own ambitions, but he has lost that advantage now. Indeed, there is nothing he can do about her anymore. Since Leonie is practically his daughter now, having promised to marry whomever the emperor wishes, Smirking, he gets off his throne and approaches the duke, wanting to make sure he gets his message loud and clear, that he should stay away from Leone. Back at Vangler Manor, Leone is having tea and grinning as well, thinking that her father should have heard everything from the emperor by now and must be seething in frustration and despair. Duchess Vangler interrupts her thoughts, asking her if she likes the sweets on the table, and she answers with a smile that she does, but her smile vanishes as she notices a green lizard crawling on the ground. The Duchess notices it too and is surprised, but before she can say anything, there is a flutter of feathers, and both Leone and her grandmother turn their heads to see the magnificent peacock standing on the other side of the table. Now, the Duchess knows what is going on, and she shouts, telling Jan and Toby to come out of hiding and take the creatures away. The boys do appear, but they refuse to get rid of the animals, which they say are their presents for Leone, a big peacock and a strong lizard, just as she wants. Neither a peacock nor a lizard are what Leone had in mind, though. In fact, if she had to choose a pet, she would want a cat or a dog, so she tells her uncles she prefers something four-legged, cute and furry, and the two quickly scramble off, eager to give her something she will like. Watching them go, Leone sighs, thinking that if she is going to go up against both the emperor and her father as she intends, she needs all the help she can get, which is why she might have to whip her happy-go-lucky uncles into shape. In the next scene, we see Leone staring at one of her paintings in a sunlit room with large windows, testing out something about her mystic ability. She has told the emperor her ability is yet to fully awaken, and she is yet to perfect it, but the truth is that it is fully awakened and perfect now, and more complicated than merely traveling through time and space through paintings. She doesn't anyone to know what she is fully capable of, though, deciding to keep that ace up her sleeve. She is still a child, after all, and therefore, she needs people to protect her. Also, she doesn't trust the emperor, who also happens to be one of the people she wants to bring down, seeing him as the root of all her misery, because it was he who decreed that House Vangler and House Heidegger be joined together. He wanted an exceptional child as a result, and now that exceptional child will make him pay. But Leone cannot do it alone. She needs someone she can rely on, and she cannot think of anyone more reliable than Osmo. If only there was a way for her to get him on her side. Her thoughts are interrupted as she hears a sound outside the door, and a moment later, her uncles call her name, making Leone wonder what mischief they are up to this time. As it turns out, they have found a lion cub, which they now present to Leone as her welcome present, adorned with a ribbon around its neck that it's now chewing on and a bow on its tail. Leone never expected a lion cub, and she is reluctant to accept it, especially seeing how its paws are almost as large as her face. But after hearing that its mother died shortly after its birth, she takes it, staring into its eyes and into a kindred soul. The emotional encounter is disrupted by the thunder of footsteps outside the hall, though, and moments later, Duke Vangler barges in, immediately scolding his son and nephew for giving a beast to his precious, delicate granddaughter. But as soon as Leone says that she finds the lion cub cute, the Duke's temper evaporates in a burst of laughter. No longer mad at the boys, he praises them for choosing a good gift, saying Leone deserves no less than a lion cub for a pet. 
He asks Leonie if she has already named it, and after setting it down, she gives it the name Roshan, the cub seemingly approving as it sprawls at her feet. Just then, a maid enters, informing the Duke that Leonie's bedroom is finally finished, and the Duke grabs Leonie's hand, excited to have her see her new bedroom. Jan and Toby come along, finding the Duchess already waiting outside the bedroom door with a group of maids. She places a blindfold over Leonie's eyes and then leads her through the door. Once Leonie is inside, the Duchess gives her permission to remove her blindfold, and after she does, she gasps, unable to believe how beautiful her room is, with nearly everything a soft shade of pink, including the canopy over the bed and the huge teddy bear on the chair. If she was truly a child, she would have loved this, but as a 32-year-old soul in the body of a child, she isn't sure, though she ends up liking it more after the Duke directs her gaze to the ceiling, which is painted with a fresco of cherubim, almost making Leonie feel as if she is in an art gallery or a cathedral. Her grandfather informs her that Michelangelo himself painted this ceiling, and Leonie can hardly believe it. The greatest painter of all time, responsible for painting the interior of most of the churches in the country, agreed to paint the ceiling of a girl's bedroom. How did her grandparents even convince him to do it? As she continues to be overwhelmed, her speech robbed by awe, the Duke and Duchess begin to worry. The Duchess tells Leone that if there is something she doesn't like, they can have it changed, only wanting Leone to be happy. The Duke starts to question the design as well, wondering if he went overboard and then scolding John for not stopping him. Hearing their words and seeing their faces, Leone's mind becomes clear. In her previous life, she was so preoccupied with trying to gain her father's love that she didn't think to look for her mother's family. Yet now, as she looks at them, she feels as if she has finally found the love she is looking for, the family that she belongs to. It was just right there the whole time waiting for her. Realizing this now, tears brim in her eyes, and she runs to her grandparents, hugging them and thanking them for their present. For the first time, she finally feels that she is not alone. At dinner, the whole family gathers for a wonderful meal. At first, they eat in comfortable silence, their utensils clattering every now and then as they enjoy their food. Then Leone speaks, having a request to make. Toby is the first to respond, saying he will gladly give Leone whatever she asks, even if it's her father's head on a platter, which Duke Vangler initially approves of. But after Leone makes a face, he retracts his approval, scolding Toby for making such a foolish suggestion. Leone goes on to make her request, asking her grandfather if he can give the Imperial Academy she used to attend permission to exhibit her paintings, saying her father refused. At once, the Duke stands up, offering to speak to the Dean of the Academy right away, which the Duchess encourages him to do. Then he goes, leaving Leone smiling, feeling glad that the exhibit has been taken care of. Now, she can go on to her next order of business, which concerns her debt to Countess Michelson. She meets the Countess a few days later in the garden, who by then has heard about Leone's upcoming exhibit. She already suspects what Leone intends to do at the exhibit, and Leone confirms this saying that she's looking forward to showing everyone her mystic ability. As Leone and Countess Michelson sit down in the gazebo to enjoy some tea, Duke Vangler looks down from his study with a look of concern. He doesn't like the idea of his granddaughter being alone with such a shady woman. The Duchess, too, is concerned, but she tells her husband to have faith in Leone, reminding him that their granddaughter can take care of herself as she proved during her mother's funeral. They are not the only ones feeling uneasy, though, Toby also watching Leone from behind some bushes with a pout. Suddenly, he hears a purr from beside him and he turns his head to find that Rochin has followed him, seemingly wanting to play. As quietly as he can, he tries to shoo the cub away, but the rustling of the leaves in the bushes doesn't escape Countess Michelson's notice. Suspecting an innocent spy, she makes the observation that Leone is well-loved at Vangler Manor, which makes Leone blush, but she retains a cool demeanor and sighs, telling the Countess to skip the small talk and just go straight to the point of her visit. The Countess gladly obliges, taking out a sealed envelope from her purse. She places it on the table, asking Leone to invite the person whose name is on the note inside to her upcoming exhibit at the Imperial Academy. Curious, Leone opens it, and as soon as she sees the name, her eyebrows arch. Why him of all people? The Countess doesn't give her a reason, simply saying that there is no harm in him coming and that he may even be a good subject for testing Leone's ability. Leone more or less understands why the Countess chose him, and at any rate, she has no choice but to agree as payment for the favor the Countess did for her at the funeral. The agreement reached and the debt settled. The Countess leaves with a satisfied grin. She hopes this will not be the last time she and Leone meet, though, saying that for such an interesting girl as Leone, her services are always available. Leone says nothing, 
watching her guest depart and then staring at the envelope in her hand after the Countess has gone. She reflects on her past life, remembering that Osmo mentioned receiving help from the Countess when she ended up in prison. He ended up dying though, so does that mean the Countess betrayed him or did they both end up dead? Leonie does not know the answer and she finds it pointless to wonder. What is past is past. All she has to do now is make use of what she knows to take advantage of people like the Countess. As Leonie is deep in thought, Toby continues to watch from behind the bushes, and seeing the expression on his niece's face, he is intrigued. Why does she look so serious, more so than any child can be? Furthermore, why does she have the aura of maturity about her even though she is younger than him? He can almost imagine her as an adult looking down on him but he shakes his head, ridding himself of such silly thoughts. As he does, the bushes shake, the rustling of their leaves catching Leonie's attention. She remembers that someone is still there, and judging from the glimpse of red hair, she knows that it's Toby, so she tells him to come out. He does, with Rochin at his side, scratching his head and wearing a sheepish grin like a crook who has been caught. Leonie tries to keep a straight face as she asks him to sit down, but she ends up laughing heartily in amusement as she thinks of the lengths the people at Vangler Manor would go to just to show they care about her. Toby is charmed by her laughter and blushes, though he clears his throat and remains composed like a young gentleman. Leonie teases him about not being gentlemanly, however, because he was eavesdropping on a conversation between ladies, and as she pours him a cup of coffee with a grin, she threatens him, saying that if he spills whatever he heard today to anyone else, he will never become a proper gentleman. The thought horrifies Toby so much that he can't speak, and so as proof of him keeping his word as a gentleman, Leonie urges him to simply drink the coffee without any sugar, and Toby gulps it down, ignoring the bitter taste as he holds on to his pride. Afterward, he lies and claims to have enjoyed the coffee, hoping that it will convince Leonie that he is a gentleman. But under the table, his knees are trembling, a fact only Rochin notices as he chews on Toby's shoelaces. The day of Leone's exhibit arrives and it is a grander event than everyone expected. With fireworks, flowers, and plenty of guests, the whole spectacle proof that Duke Vangler dotes on his granddaughter. Even Leone is surprised at the number of guests, but her eyes search the crowd for just one person, the one Countess Michelson asked her to invite. She doesn't see him though, her attention is instead drawn to Toby and Jan, who are causing quite a ruckus by bringing Rochin with them. Leone decides to stay away from them, mingling with the other guests, until finally, she hears the murmurs and she turns her head towards the entrance, knowing her special guest has arrived. It is Marquis Carl Jaspers, one of the most powerful men in the eastern part of the empire. Unfortunately though, he was injured during one of the fiercest battles at the eastern border, and that injury has caused an infection that is now eating away at his flesh, now evident even on his face. Since then, he has not appeared in public, so everyone is surprised to see him, all except Leone, who steps forward to greet him with a smile and a curtsy. Just from looking at her, Marquis Jaspers can tell two things, that Leone is Gideon's child and that she is no ordinary child, which is why he accepts her invitation when she offers to lead him to her special exhibit. He is surprised though, when he sees only a ladder in the room leading to a door in the ceiling, and when Leone tells him he must climb the ladder, he refuses, thinking it is all some kind of joke. Leone calmly tells him, however, that like many members of the Vangler family, she has a special gift, one which she will gladly share with him if he agrees to climb the ladder. She also tells him that they are waiting for him, and Marquis Jasper's eyes grow wide, wondering if she is referring to the same people he has in mind. There seems to be only one way to find out, and if there is even a slight chance he can see those people again, he agrees to take the risk, beginning his ascent up the ladder. As Marquis Jaspers makes his way up the rungs of the ladder, he recalls his unusual conversation with his second daughter. It was she who asked him to attend the exhibit, promising him an otherworldly experience. And when he refused, she placed her inheritance on the line, saying that if the exhibit does end up to his liking, she will gladly forfeit her inheritance. He had thought she was being foolish, but decided to indulge her just the same. He never expected to be asked to climb a ladder though, its steps creaking beneath his boots. It feels like forever since he has climbed a ladder. In fact, the last time was during the Battle of Ghouli Heights, that fierce battle where he got injured and tens of thousands perished, only a tiny percent of the soldiers surviving. Just before all hell broke loose, Carl was climbing up to a guard post to check enemy movement, but before he could reach the top, a cannonball hit the tower, shattering it into splinters and killing all of his comrades who were inside, while he ended up falling, suffering a terrible injury. 
Since then, he has lived his days in anguish, both physically and mentally, and many times, he wished that he could turn back time, for if he could, he would get his comrades out of the tower and make sure they were all safe, himself included, before the cannon started firing. Suddenly, a thought occurs to Carl. What if Leone's ability is to turn back time? What if the door at the top of the ladder actually leads to the guard tower from 17 years ago? With this in mind, he hurries. And sure enough, when he opens the door, he sees his comrades in uniform, looking just the same as he remembers them, all sitting around and drinking. He shouts at them to get out before a cannonball hits the tower, but they only laugh, thinking he must have just woken up from a nightmare. They offer him a glass of wine, saying it will help calm him down, and for a moment, he is too shocked and confused to speak, but he is determined to save them all, so he repeats his warning, telling everyone to run away. This time, Carl is met with serious faces, an austere silence falling over the room. Then one of them speaks, informing Carl that there is no point in them running away, because they are already dead. Carl falls to his knees as his heart sinks, realizing he has been a fool to think he can change the past. His comrades agree that he has been a fool, scolding him for being holed up in his mansion for the past 17 years, when he should be living his life to the fullest both for his own sake and theirs. Carl winces as he hears this, seemingly scalded by the words. He cannot deny that it is the truth though, and as he realizes his mistake, tears brim in his eyes. What exactly has he been doing with his life? One of Carl's comrades tells him to lift his chin, touching his face and telling him everything will be all right. As his hand falls from Carl's cheek, there is a hissing sound, the scar marring Carl's face seemingly evaporating, but Carl doesn't notice it, still in shock. He listens as his comrades apologize for leaving him behind, then bid him farewell, telling him they will wait for him when his time comes, though hopefully not soon. And only when they are about to leave does he spring into action, chasing after them and begging them not to go, but in the next instant, they are gone, and the Marquis is back in the room at the academy, back at the bottom of the ladder. As he is still trying to regain his bearings, a sheet of paper floats through the air, and he catches it, stunned to find a drawing of his deceased comrades drinking happily in his hand. He asks Leone what has just happened, asking if she brought his comrades back to life, and Leone shakes her head, saying she only showed him what he desired to see the most through one of her drawings. Indeed, the Marquis cannot deny that he saw what he wanted to see the most, and he holds Leone's drawing close to his heart. He still cannot believe that it was only an illusion, though since it looked and felt too real, as if he was really there with his comrades. Leone tells him it might have been an illusion, but the sentiments of his fallen comrades are real, as is their parting gift, which is the healing of the scar on his face and the infection plaguing his body. The Marquis has yet to confirm the change in his appearance, but he knows this experience has changed him, a sense of peace already filling the hole in his chest, and he thanks Leone from the bottom of his heart, saying he will never forget what she has done for him. Leone thanks him for his kind words in turn, trying to stay humble, but inside she is feeling smug, thinking that everything is slowly but surely working out in her favor. In the next scene, we find Duke Vangler's study filled with presents that Jan is helping him sort, his desk with a pile of letters, all of them from people longing to meet Leone and witness her gift, which comes as no surprise since the Emperor himself has acknowledged Leone's gift and news of what she did with Marquis Jasper has spread, the Marquis himself speaking highly of her to everyone he knows. He has even offered Leone a mine to repay her for using her gift to help him, but Leone has refused, saying that the Marquis has done enough for the Empire, which makes Duke Vangler truly proud of her. While he thinks it may be a problem to have to greet all the guests waiting in their carriages outside the mansion, it is a problem he does not mind having, even laughing out loud because of it. In contrast to the bustling Vangler Manor, Heidegger Manor is like a ghost town, with only the chirping of crickets filling the garden. The grounds are empty, and the halls are deserted. In the study, Duke Heidegger is deep in thought, having heard about how Leone healed Marquis Jasper. He grits his teeth and bites his lip, frustrated that he had not noticed her ability sooner. If only he had, he would certainly be in a less worrisome position now, but at least he still has one daughter left, and he summons Osmo, telling him to bring Sharon right away. Moments later, Osmo returns to the study with a floundering Sharon in his arms, the little girl beating Osmo with her little fists. And when her governess tells her to calm down, she grabs the poor woman's hair as well, shouting that she hates everyone and that she wants her mommy back. When Gideon calmly tells her to be quiet, she jumps out of Osmo's arms and shouts at him too, telling him she hates him. She's about to say more too, 
But Gideon narrows his eyes, the silent intimidation in his gaze filling Sharon with fear and forcing her to be silent. She is so frightened, in fact, that she begins to tremble, and tears leak out of the corners of her eyes, and she turns to her governess and Osmo as if asking them to rescue her. But her governess simply shakes her head, while Osmo sighs, straightening his cravat. Sniffling, Sharon mumbles an apology, but her manner of speech just irritates her father all the more. He no longer finds her adorable, wondering if she ever was, and he certainly isn't pleased with her behavior, telling her that Heidegger's do not act like fools. He asks Sharon how old she is, and she replies that she is seven. He then points out that her sister, Leonie, is ten and able to act like a proper young lady, so he expects her to behave at least half as well as Leonie does. He turns to the governess, who he remembers also taught Leonie, and exhorts her to pour all her efforts into educating Sharon. Daunted by the Duke's expectations, the governess protests, but the Duke will not hear any of it, even giving the governess permission to beat his daughter if that is what it takes to make Sharon behave like nobility. Back at Vangler Manor, Leone is reading a letter from Countess Michelson, who informs her that Marquis Jaspers has returned to the eastern provinces after passing his title down to his second daughter. He has used a large amount of his fortune as well to help those still suffering from the war 17 years ago, which is another idea he attributes to Leone's gift. He reiterates that he is grateful to Leone, and should Leone require anything, House Jaspers is at her service. Leone smiles, thinking she has gained an invaluable ally, but her smile vanishes when a maid comes in to tell her that her father, Duke Heidegger, has come to visit. Duke Vangler is not thrilled to see Leonie's father either, thinking it is shameless of him to visit. Jan understands why Duke Heidegger has come, though, remarking that he must be anxious to get his daughter back now that she is famous. The three of them wait for Duke Heidegger to step out of his carriage, which he does looking dashing and graceful as usual, but it is Osmo who Leone runs to excitedly, hugging him. Osmo hugs her, saying he is happy that she seems to have adjusted well to her life at Vangler Manor. Gideon watches them, slightly envious of their reunion, but he does not show it maintaining a solemn expression as he thanks Duke Vangler for taking care of Leone and urges him to accept the money he has brought as payment for child support. He also makes a request, saying he wishes to speak with Leone in private. Duke Vangler does not approve of it, but he glances at Leone to know her answer, and when she nods, he reluctantly agrees to Duke Heidegger's request, deciding to let Leone handle her father. Leone and Gideon move to a room inside the manor to have tea and talk. Gideon speaks first, expressing his relief to see Leone doing well. Leone, however, is not moved by her father's concern and tells him to speak to her as he usually does, sparing her the niceties that she isn't accustomed to hearing. Wincing, Gideon clenches his fist, rattled by his daughter's words. He knows he treated her cruelly, something he can no longer do, and he wants to make things up to her by showing her more affection, but his pride holds him back. Watching him struggle with his pride, Leone feels sorry for him, wondering why she ever sought the affection of such a pathetic man. He tells Leone he has heard of her bargain with the Emperor, lauding it as genius, and thanks her for asking the Emperor to spare him and Sharon. But Leone is not interested in hearing her father's pretty words, especially since she knows her father is just saying all this in hopes of getting on her good side, which she thinks is no longer possible. Sooner or later, she will make her father pay for all his sins. Nothing he says will change her mind about that. She asks him why he came, which she is more curious to know, and Gideon replies that he wants to repay the favor. Leone already knows what she wants from her father, and she blurts it out, telling him to give her Osmo, who is a competent advisor and furthermore, the only man who was kind to her while she was still staying at Heidegger Manor. Gideon falls silent, contemplating the request. Leone consents that he doesn't want to grant it, which is understandable, because advisors that are both reliable and trustworthy are hard to find, but that is her father's problem, not hers. She points out that Osmo is honorable and loyal, so even if he no longer serves the Duke, he will not do anything to cause him any disgrace. And Leone assures her father that she will not ask Osmo to do anything of the kind either. The Duke finally accedes, and Leone grins, thinking she has just secured another victory. Downstairs, Toby is busy trying to destroy all the presents Duke Heidegger has brought for Leone, thinking that his niece has no need of them. He even orders Rochin to rip them all up. Osmo is worried to see this, but Leone tells him not to mind them and just to follow her down the hall, and he obeys. 
He has already been informed by the Duke that Leone will be his employer from now on, which he was surprised by, but before he could even let the news sink in or utter any protests, the Duke left him behind, making him wonder if he was expendable all along. He isn't disappointed to be serving Leone though, and after she shows him to the parlor, he kneels before her, gladly pledging himself in service to her. Leone tells him she is happy as well, knowing just the extent of his loyalty and kindness, how he sacrificed even his life just to help her in the past, but she tells him there is something she must clarify before they begin working, and that is that she doesn't want him as her advisor. Rather, she wants him as a teacher, specifically on the subject of the Heidegger composure she has heard so much about. Osmo is puzzled, wondering who exactly he is supposed to teach, and Leone replies that she wants everyone at the Vangler mansion to learn it, thinking that the family has gone too soft, lacking the usual aggressiveness or even assertiveness required of nobility. For example, even though they know Leone helped Marquis Jaspers to meet his departed comrades, not one of the Vanglers has asked to see Paula. Osmo agrees that even though he has only met them, he finds them warm and accommodating, which he does not exactly find a bad thing. But Leone gives him another example, saying that even though House Vangler is now in a position of prominence and power, they have not made any attempts to avenge Paula's death, simply smiling at everyone. It's not that she wants them to act on their emotions and make enemies. She simply wants everyone to know that House Vangler will not, any deed against them, go unpunished. Osmo understands that Leone simply wants to protect the Vangler family, likening them to a sea anemone that must survive in order for the clownfish who live in it to prosper. And Leone grins, glad that she and Osmo see each other eye to eye. She knew they would, though, which is why she wanted so badly to have him at her side, and now that he is, she knows they can accomplish much together. Suddenly, the door to the parlor opens, Toby stepping in with a shout. As soon as he realizes that Leone isn't alone though, he stops, sending a scowl in Osmo's direction. Lowering his voice, he tells Leone to let him know if Osmo is being a nuisance to her, but he has barely finished speaking when Jan appears behind him, startling him. Pinching his cousin's cheek, Jan asks Toby what he is doing, and the two bicker and start to fight, which shows Osmo exactly how much work he has ahead of him. Leone has complete faith in him though and tells him that he will be her right hand to assist her in achieving all of her goals. To this end, he can ask for help from people he can trust, but he must never go near Countess Mickelson. This Leone makes very clear. Osmo is slightly surprised by the order, having presumed that the Countess and Leone were on good terms after the funeral, but he nods, understanding the order and expressing his full intent to comply. Leone moves on to Osmo's next assignment, which involves Magda. She believes her stepmother has given birth by now, which Osmo confirms, meaning Leone can already have her. She has already asked Duke Heidegger to give her Magda in addition to Osmo, and he has agreed, having no interest in seeing the woman again, though he requested that Leone show her some compassion for Sharon's sake and not do anything excessive. Regarding this matter, Leone hands Osmo a letter to be delivered to the royal chamberlain, and as he studies the envelope, he asks curiously what it is about. Leone gladly tells him, though it is something for Osmo's ears only, and after hearing it, he praises her for being prudent, saying that he will promptly arrange a meeting between Leone and Magda. The next day, Leone pays a visit to the dungeon, the clicking of her heels echoing in the empty hallway. By now, Magda seems to be traumatized by the sound, and she lies down on the floor and trembles as she covers her ears, not wanting to hear whatever comes next. But she still hears Leone's voice congratulating her for safely delivering her baby, and she sits up, curious about why Gideon's daughter has come. Leone glances at Magda as she remarks on her father's cruelty, thinking that her sorry state is a far cry from the woman she used to be, the woman who used to be the subject of Leone's nightmares in her past life. We get a glimpse of Magda in that life, appearing to Gideon in his study shortly after their wedding to complain about Leone. Gideon tells her to do whatever she wants with the girl, not caring what happens to Leone, and Magda proceeds to make Leone's life hell, starting by destroying her drawings and paintings, calling them garbage and scoffing at the thought that someone would want to buy them. From that day on, Magda would hurl insults at Leone whenever she could, often comparing her to Sharon, but always finding her sorely lacking, whittling her confidence down until she had none left. But Magda wasn't even content with that, even resorting to slowly poisoning Duke Heidegger, Sharon, and Leone with arsenic so as to wipe the whole Heidegger family out. And she was able to get away with it for two years before she was discovered and killed by Gideon's own sword. 
Even after Magda died though, Leone continued to suffer not just from the lingering effects of the arsenic, but from all the torment Magda put her through. Magda's evil laughter echoing so loudly in Leone's mind that each time she heard someone snicker, she froze in fear. Indeed, Magda was the embodiment of a wicked stepmother, terror incarnate, but Leone is not afraid of her anymore. Gripping the bars, Magda asks Leone why she came to visit, telling her that if she is only here to talk about her mother, she should leave. Leone answers, however, that she has no interest in discussing what happened to Paula, only in making Magda pay for all that she has made Leone suffer. Magda does not understand Leone's words, to her knowledge not having done anything else to the child apart from killing her mother. Yes, if she had gone on to become the Duchess, she would have made Leone's life miserable before killing her, but there is no chance of that now. She tells Leone that she will be executed soon, which means she will already be paying for her crimes, and asks Leone to be merciful enough to let her live her remaining days in peace. But Leone claims to have no mercy to spare, not after all the mercy that was denied her in her past life. Still, she has asked the Emperor to pardon Magda for her crimes, which Magda can barely believe, overcome with joy and with hope. She had thought something was unusual with Leone, who isn't acting at all like a child, but now she doesn't care. Clasping her hands, she thanks Leone profusely with tears in her eyes, which is exactly the reaction Leone was hoping for. Leone takes Magda's gratitude and enthusiasm as a sign that her stepmother wants to live, and indeed, Magda confirms this, which Leone finds a bit of a disappointment, since it seemed earlier that Magda was prepared to die. Now that Leone has given her hope, though, Magda wants to live, even if it is just until her child has grown into a young lad, and she begs for Leone to be merciful enough to grant her this opportunity. Leonie informs Magda that the decision is out of her hands, though. In fact, the Emperor has already decided what to do with her, which is to reduce her sentence out of sympathy for her cause, since granting a full pardon is impossible. Even this makes Magda glad, and she asks if she can hold her son in her arms and nurse him in prison, saying he was taken away from her even before she could give him a name. Leonie tells her the baby has already been given the name Nathan by Duke Heidegger, a name which Magda repeats in a loving whisper as tears trickle down her cheeks. But when Leone adds that in addition to a name, Gideon has also bestowed his hopes on the baby, wanting the child to grow up to be a swordmaster just like him, the warmth and tenderness in Magda's chest vanishes, replaced by fear, and Leone knows exactly why. She knows that Magda's son is not Duke Heidegger's, but that of the bodyguard that had been assigned to her, and therefore, the boy will not have any of the Swordmaster's abilities that Gideon possesses. Furthermore, the more he grows, the more Gideon will see that the boy resembles his real father, and it is easy to assume what will happen when he discovers the truth. Filled with fear, Magda begs Leone for her mercy once more, this time saying she does not care what happens to her as long as her son is spared. Leone is surprised to see Magda act like a mother for once, remarking that her stepmother didn't seem to care about Sharon, yet cares so much about Nathan. Is it because he is the son of the man she loves? At any rate, Leone doesn't care. The fact that Magda loves her son will only make her punishment worse, as the reason Leone asked the Emperor to spare Magda's life is so that she will be around to watch her son's suffering and downfall. Leone's gift to Magda for everything she has done. Knowing Leone's true intentions and realizing she is facing a worse fate now, Magda starts to scream in despair, begging Leone over and over for mercy. But Leone just grins as she walks away from Magda's cell, having nothing more to say to her wretched stepmother. The next day, the news of the reduction of Magda's sentence breaks out, namely, that after receiving a request for clemency from Leone Heidegger and Duke Wangler, the Emperor decided to reduce Magda's sentence from death to life imprisonment, which the common people rejoice at taking it as a sign of Leone's kindness and the Wangler family's compassion. The nobility, however, know better, having access to more details, such as the fact that instead of spending the rest of her life in prison, Magda is being sent to a dye factory, where she will suffer a slow and painful death, just like the death she gave Paula they know Magda is being made an example of, sending a message that anyone who messes with the Wangler family will meet a fate worse than death. Indeed, as Magda realizes where she is being dragged to, her eyes grow wide in horror and she begs for death, but her fate has already been decided. At the Wangler Manor, the family is less concerned with the news and more focused on the upcoming royal banquet to honor Leone, to which they have all been invited. Jan and Toby argue about Rochin, with Toby wanting to bring him and Jan insisting that they can't. He tells Toby that no one has ever brought a lion to the royal banquet, but Toby says that Rochin is not just a lion, but also a part of the Wangler family. In fact, it was Jan himself who brought Rochin into the family. 
Jan knows this, and now he slightly regrets it, never having thought that Toby would dress Rochin up or suggest bringing him to the royal banquet. Toby, however, is proud of the costume that he has put on Rochin, thinking that it will go well with his outfit and make him look cooler, especially in the eyes of Leone. Jan sighs. Just as he thought, Toby is just kicking up a fuss to impress Leone, so he shuts Toby's hopes down, telling him that if he doesn't stop making a fuss, he will tell Leone about how Toby can't even drink coffee. Toby doesn't know how Jan found this out, but he has no choice but to back down and put Rochin back. As he does, Duke Vangler glances impatiently at the staircase, wondering when Leone will appear, and she finally does, wearing a sparkling lilac dress with a pattern of flying birds, and with her curls all straightened out. The ends folded in neatly so that her hair looks shorter. The whole Vangler family is mesmerized, the Duke even shedding a tear as he remarks about how his granddaughter has grown to be a stunning young woman, and Leone is happy that they approve of her new look, but she doesn't want to dawdle, saying that they should make their way to the palace so that they don't end up late. They move to the entrance where the carriages are waiting, the Duke inviting Leone to ride with him, which she happily accepts. As the carriage trudges along, her thoughts wander to the upcoming banquet, which she knows will be attended by all the royalty and nobility, including her husband from her previous life. She suddenly feels nervous to see him, and her grandfather notices, placing a comforting hand over hers and giving her a smile as he tells her to simply enjoy today. Leone smiles back, grateful for the encouragement, Indeed, her grandfather is right. She should stop worrying about the past or the future and just have fun today. At the palace, the guests have already gathered, tongues wagging about Leone. Not only is she the star of the banquet after all, but the first person with a mystical gift in almost a century, which many of them thought they would never live to see. The room turns quiet though, as Lord Jaspers and his daughter, the current Marchioness, arrive, only to buzz even louder shortly after, as people talk about how amazing it is that the former Marquis's injuries have truly disappeared. They are still marveling at Leone's talent when she appears with the Vangler family, announced as the pride of the empire and greeted by cheers and thunderous applause. They start to flock around her, eager to get to know her better, but the crowd disperses when an even more important figure arrives, the emperor himself. As he makes his way to the front of the room, mouths grow silent and heads bow, though some steal sideward glances at the emperor. As for Leone, her gaze is not on the emperor, but on the boy walking behind him with golden hair, blue eyes and handsome features, the kind prince who used to be her husband. The prince's name is revealed to be Isaac, and the story pauses to let us know what happened in the past. We start with a scene between the emperor and Gideon at the palace, the emperor pestering Gideon once more about whether or not Leone has any special gifts, and Gideon ruefully informs him that Leone has not manifested any mystic abilities yet. However, he is certain that his daughter has the aptitude to become both sorcerer and swordmaster, which is something that can be handed down to her offspring. The emperor is pleased with this idea, and he has just the ideal husband for Leone in mind, his son Isaac. Though the firstborn son, Isaac's mother and his maternal family are gone now, so he is nothing more than a pawn. Still, he has inherited his father's power of dominion, which makes him useful and excellent for producing an heir. The marriage is arranged between Isaac and Leone, who is only 15 at the time. On their wedding night, Isaac goes to Leone's bed, the duties his father placed upon him heavily weighing on his shoulders. Even so, he still sees Leone as a child and he can sense her fear, so he promises not to do anything to her until she is ready. In the meanwhile, acting like a kind older brother to her. They live their days in peace, though Isaac is often troubled by the brewing war for the throne. If the battle for succession breaks out into a fully blown war, he knows he will be the first to fall since he does not have any strong allies, and he tells Leone that if this happens, he wants her to find another husband, a nice man who can make her happy. Leone tries not to pay attention to this kind of talk, but a year after their marriage, Isaac is indeed assassinated, leaving Leone a childless widow. The story continues in the present with Leone standing in front of the emperor, who goes on and on about how her gift is a gift to him and the empire. She's starting to get bored by his speech in fact, so she turns her gaze to Isaac, who looks perfectly poised in his seat, then to his sister Princess Calabria, or Kayla, who is the complete opposite, not bothering to hide her yawn. Kayla is two years older than Leone, and in the past life, the two were friends, Kayla a strong woman who was unafraid to speak her mind. Even now, as she catches Leone staring, Kayla glares, almost growling, and Leone suppresses a chuckle, 
thinking that Kayla is reckless even as a child, though more adorable. The Emperor finally comes to the end of his speech, granting Leone a sorcerer's privileges, and when he is done, the room erupts into applause. By then, Leone is exhausted, which the Duchess notices with a look of concern. Leone says she will be fine though, she just needs to go to the restroom to freshen up, and she asks Toby to accompany her. He gladly does, offering her his arm. Proudly, he escorts Leone down the hall, and as she walks, her thoughts wander once more to her past life, particularly to her most recent husband, Prince Rutger. She had thought he would show up, but she supposes he cannot even if he wants to, since he is only eighth in succession, which makes him almost as bad as a bastard prince. Her thoughts of him are dispelled when she sees Isaac sitting on a bench in the garden, and she quickly leaves Toby's side to go to him, greeting him with a curtsy. Isaac is surprised to see her, but agrees to let her sit with him, and for a while, the two sit in silence, listening to the soft rustling of the leaves with the evening breeze and the chirping of the crickets. Isaac speaks first, congratulating Leone for the honor the emperor has bestowed upon her. He apologizes, too, for not having congratulated her sooner, but Leone tells him it is fine since she doesn't even even feel worthy of congratulations. Isaac is surprised to hear this, but understands Leone better after she asks him if he was happy when he was made the crown prince. He does not want to speak of his own troubles though, and this time, it is Leone who apologizes, not having intended to make him uncomfortable. He replies with another apology though, making it clear that he has not taken any offense from her words. Leone thinks he is still as soft as ever, which she used to admire, but now, she takes advantage of it, telling him she has always wished for a kind older brother like him and an older sister like Calabria, and she hopes they will both attend the tea party that her grandfather is throwing for her soon. Isaac tries to talk his way out of attending, saying that Leone should hang out with children her age and that he doesn't get to decide which parties to attend, but Leone does not let him escape, assuring him the emperor will surely let him attend her party since he has promised to grant her every request. Then before he can come up with more excuses, she leaves, telling him she will wait for him at her party. She knows he will show up even if it's just because he cannot stand breaking a little girl's heart. Her victory assured, she goes back to Toby, who scolds her for taking so long and demands to know what she and the crown prince we're discussing. As he goes on, Leone doing her best to ignore another boring speech. Both are unaware that there is someone else present, watching them from behind some bushes, a little boy with dark brown hair and deep blue eyes. Leone returns to the banquet hall, searching for Kayla, now that she has finished speaking to Isaac. She finds the princess gulping down a goblet of wine as if it were juice thinking that it is no wonder she develops a high tolerance for alcohol later on. Slowly, Leone approaches Kayla's side, and Kayla immediately frowns and glares, telling Leone to get lost. If she was an ordinary child, Leone would have found the princess rude and even cried, but right now, she just <laughs> chuckles, already used to Kayla's abrasive demeanor, which she actually finds endearing. As Kayla stares at her, puzzled by her amusement, Leone makes her move, remarking on how the hall stenches of power mongers, the very thing that Kayla could not stand in the past. Indeed, Kayla shares Leone's opinion, and the two girls quickly <laughs> form a bond. Kayla is surprised that a girl from House Heidegger has a sense of humor, and Leone replies that she is Vangler on the inside, which means she is a little reckless. Kayla is aware of how reckless the Vanglers can be in spite of their kindness, or maybe because of it. So she agrees when Leone says the Vanglers need a little restraint and wonders if Leone will be the one to teach them. Leone claims she isn't qualified, saying she cannot even protect one Vangler, her mother. Kayla frowns to hear the guilt in Leone's voice and grabs her hand, telling her she must not blame herself for the sins of others. This reminds Leone of how Kayla used to be, always scolding her whenever she made self-deprecating remarks, instead urging her to find her confidence and not let others walk all over her. Even after Isaac's death, Kayla remained her friend, and during her second pregnancy, which she had at the palace, Kayla was there to support her, encouraging her to bear her fangs at the monsters all around her now that she is a mother, even her own husband who has been ignoring her. Kayla made Leone realize that she had to do something to protect herself and her unborn child, but by then, it was too late. In the end, she wasn't able to protect anyone, not even Kayla, but not this time. This time, she will make sure to protect everyone she holds dear, including Kayla, who she intends to remain friends with for a long time. As a start to this, she invites Kayla to her tea party just as she invited Isaac, and though Kayla hesitates for a moment, 
She eventually gives in, making Leone happy. It seems her plan is going to work, and she cannot wait for the tea party to carry it out. The day of the tea party arrives, the garden filled with children who are all excited by Leone's menagerie. One of them, Artur Gould, especially gushes over the peacock, saying he will ask his parents to buy him one too. Leone recognizes him as the man who will cause a big scandal in the empire, and tells him to throw a huge tantrum if his parents don't get him a peacock, hoping that his parents will get mad at him and teach him some discipline so that he grows up to be more righteous. Artur leaves and puts Leone's advice into practice at once, causing a fuss right there in the garden as his mother angrily looks on. Even this isn't amusing enough for Leone though, who is getting bored hanging around helpless children while waiting for the prince and princess to arrive. What is taking them so long? Finally, they show up, catching Leone yawning, and she quickly recovers her grace to greet them properly. Glad that they have arrived, but she is taken aback when she notices that they have brought someone else with them. A blue-eyed boy who Isaac introduces as the eighth prince, Rutger, and who apparently begged him to be allowed to tag along. Leone's eyes grow wide at meeting her third husband as a child, and she stammers a little while greeting him, her mind going over everything she knows about him. Just as Isaac said, Rutger is the eighth prince, born of a maid who was executed right after his birth to hide the fact that the emperor slept with a woman of such low birth. The emperor himself did not pay him any attention, and so he lived his life as barely more than a servant in the palace, neglected and ignored by everyone except Isaac and Kayla. Only when the war for succession began, and the people recognized Rutger's prowess in battle, as well as his other gifts did they start to pay attention, some scrambling to curry favor with him, and some beginning to fear him. Right now, he is just a boy though, staring at her, and she can't help but stare back, which Kayla teases her for. Indeed, Leonie cannot stop looking at Rutger's blue eyes, or his dark brown hair, which is an indication that his power of dominion is strong. The darker the hair color, the stronger the ability, though it did not awaken until much later, as well as his clothes that are shabby compared to his siblings. Rutger does not seem to mind, blushing and stuttering as he greets Leonie and urges her to call him by name. He clearly likes Leonie, making her blush and turn, but she comes back to her senses, reminding herself of her important mission. To accomplish it, she asks Jan to keep Rutger company for a moment. While she escorts Isaac and Kayla to the garden, she leads them to the gazebo, and there shows them a painting, inviting them to join her for an adventure. As soon as Isaac and Kayla agree, Leone activates her gift, and in a flash of light, the three of them enter the painting, finding themselves surrounded by light and dazzling colors. As the royal siblings are still in awe, Leone explains that she has transported them to a safe space where no one will hear what they are about to say, which makes Kayla think it is something serious. Leone proceeds, explaining that after her gift awakened, a dream was born in her heart. A dream of a better empire, where power is not held by ruthless men like Duke Heidegger, but by benevolent men ruled by a kind emperor like Isaac. Isaac and Kayla realize what Leone is proposing, and they are in shock, Isaac even scolding her for being rash with her ideas and words. But Leone is not at all bothered. She says she has come to realize that power is what shapes the world, and therefore if one has enough power, one can change the world and decide what can and cannot be done. Leone has power now and she is sure she wants to use it to create a peaceful empire and in turn, a kinder world. Isaac lauds her for her dream but reminds her that not all dreams can be made into reality. Even if Leone is powerful and in possession of a rare gift, she is still all alone, so what can she do? Instead of answering this question, Leone lets Isaac and Kayla in on the information the Emperor shared with him, revealing to them that their father wants to travel back in time, to start his reign all over again with even more cruelty and malice, which Leone cannot allow. She has already taken steps to prevent this, lying to the Emperor that her gift has not fully awakened, but she is simply stalling, and in the meantime, Isaac must act. He must gather more allies and get more support. By joining hands with Leone, he will already have the Vangler family and the Jaspers family at his side, but they're not enough. Leone knows that there are people willing to support Isaac from other parts of the empire, but they will have to be won over. Kala cannot believe what Leone has just said. Can her brother really amass so much support? Leone assures them it is possible, especially with her gift, and she manages to convince them. But now, Kayla has a different concern. For Leone to just tell her and Isaac all of her plans, she must trust them beyond a doubt. But how can she be sure they will go along with her plan instead of selfishly betraying her as royalty is prone to do? What if they decided to have her arrested for treason? What would she do then? Leone just grins and tells them that if she had received even the slightest suspicion that they would betray her, she would have decided to leave them trapped in the painting, a thought which sends a shiver up to Kayla's spine. 
She had not expected Leone to be so cunning, but then, Leone is half Heidegger after all. As for Isaac, he just stares at Leone, thinking that she is truly like a lion, confident in the fact that she reigns supreme over everyone. In spite of himself, he starts to consider her proposal, having long been wanting to change the empire for the better, but having no power to do it. Leone has just promised him that power though, so shouldn't he join hands with her and make the dream of a better empire into a reality? The conversation ended and the trust is established. Leone gets them all out of the painting. She appears alone in the gazebo, the royal siblings materializing in another part of the garden so as not to draw any suspicions, which they shouldn't, because no time has passed since the three entered the painting. Indeed, the prince and princess should just be walking in the garden like they were supposed to before Leone activated her gift. And now, she goes to meet them. But she stops as she runs into Rutger, who is all by himself. Thinking he is lost, she apologizes to him, saying her uncle should have watched over him more carefully, but he says he was the one who escaped Jan, which was not an easy feat, all because he wanted to be with Leone. Leone is surprised to hear Rutger admit this, and she asks him why he wants to be with her so badly. Innocent as he is, he answers truthfully that he needs her help in order to survive, and Leonie frowns, thinking that it is her gift he is after and not her. He has never needed her, which is why it was so easy for him to abandon her and their unborn child. Crossing her arms over her chest, Leonie tells Rutger coldly that if he wants an ally, he must seek someone with actual power. On the other hand, if what he really wants is to have her on his side, then he must prove it and show himself worthy of her loyalty. This said, she turns on her heel and leaves Rutger alone, making her way through the gardens. After a while, she feels bad about how she just treated him, regretting her harshness. But what can she do? Each time she looks at his face, she is reminded of the past. So it is better for her to avoid him entirely, hoping that he will stop hounding her as well. Speaking of hounding her, Leone stops as a thought suddenly occurs to her. Since Rutger was looking for her, did he see her and the royal siblings go in and out of the painting? What if he tells someone what he saw? Leone shakes her head and calms down though, knowing Rutger would never tell anyone anything. Why, he barely spoke when they were together, even during those times when he would come to her bed. Leone looks back on the past once more, recalling her wedding night with Rutger. She sits on her bed in a robe, waiting for him to come, hoping that maybe now that they are alone, they can finally talk. But when Rutger does appear, wearing just a robe as well, he simply stares at her, pursing her lips and saying nothing, which makes Leone so uncomfortable that she has to look away and clench the sheets. Still, she waits for him to say something, to do something, and finally he comes closer, leaning over her on the bed. They are closer than ever now, and Leone can feel her heart pounding in her chest as he looks into her eyes, her whole face growing warm as she gazes back at him. Suddenly, he speaks in a soft voice, but only to tell Leone that he will wait for another time when they are both ready if that is alright with her, and she only nods. Still, she looked forward to the next time, hoping they would finally speak, but when they finally consummate their marriage, it is still done in silence, Rutger acting as if he is simply fulfilling a duty, a chore which sickened Leone so much that she was glad when she found out she was pregnant so soon. Going back to the present, Leone realizes that the conversation she had with Rutger just now, though it was more of an argument, is the longest she and Rutger have ever spoken, and she isn't sure what to make of it. Even that night, Leone's thoughts are still filled with Rutger, and she finds herself unable to sleep, even though she feels exhausted from the tea party. As she tosses and turns, then sits on her bed, she recalls the past, particularly the face of Rutger when she last saw him. What was that face he was making? It almost seemed as if he was begging her not to leave, but why would he do that when he never showed any concern for her? Surely he was just startled, since Leone vanished in front of his eyes after all. Still, she wanted to think that he loved her even just a little bit, that he cared for her, or at least felt sorry for her. After all, as much as she hates to admit it because she is embarrassed, she fell in love with Rutger the moment she saw him at their wedding. It was then that she finally understood why all the noble women of the empire were outraged when they heard that he was getting married, and to someone old and twice divorced no less. But then, they wouldn't have wagged and clicked their tongues so much if only they knew that her marriage to Rutger was one of his brother's plots to humiliate him and take him down a notch, since at that time, he was already showing potential as a future emperor. Indeed, the third prince, Max, wanted to put Rutger in his place and remind him that he is barely royalty, which is why he arranged Rutger's marriage to Leone as a gift to him. And Leone knew this, so she tried not to have any feelings for Rutger, 
but her heart would not listen. She ended up following him with her gaze just as she used to do when she was a child, starving for her father's affection. Once again, she experienced the pain of yearning for someone's love, but he hardly spoke to her, barely looking at her. Once, when they crossed paths in the garden, she thought of starting a conversation with him, hoping that they would get closer, but he just walked past her without a word, making it clear he had no interest in talking to her. Leone wonders now what happened to Rutger after she vanished. Did he go on to marry Sharon as Sharon said he would, the two of them having children of their own? Unable to restrain her curiosity, she decides to find out, since she knows she can with her ability anyway. Getting out of bed, she goes to her desk to draw a picture of how she looked like in her previous life when she was married to Rutger, and then she activates the spell. In the next instant, there is a blinding spark of light, and when that fades, Leonie finds herself in a different room, with the dress that she was last wearing, still stained with blood, fitted on a mannequin, and surrounded with flowers in the center of it. The sight of the dress shocks Leonie, and she wonders if this is a shrine Rutger made, like the ones dedicated to saints with mystic abilities. But then she notices the desk in the corner, which is what the Emperor used to own, and she realizes that she is in the Emperor's bedchamber. But why would her old, bloody dress be in the Emperor's room? Suddenly, Leonie hears a sound, the rustle of fabric, and she turns her head towards the bed, her eyes growing wide as she sees Rutger in it, all grown up and shirtless and with a look of sheer surprise, though he immediately recognizes Leonie, even though she is a child, asking her if she has really returned. The lines between the past and the present are blurring, which may alter Leone's plans for the future, though we do not know yet how, but for now, this is how this segment ends. If you like the story and want to see what happens next, please comment down below the name Leone.